Well, thanks, Michelle. Uh, it's really good to be here in this historic place. Uh, well, don't you feel it? Uh, you know. And uh, this is not the, the fleet center. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, so, yes, I'm, I am going to introduce uh, Jim Green. Uh, but before I do, I, I can't just let the opportunity go by right, to say a few things, uh, which, which I can think are kind of good background for uh, listening to Jim Green and, uh, and for getting his book, his, his extraordinary book, uh, Death in the Haymarket. Um, I was especially, especially happy to be asked to, to introduce Jim and to introduce the book uh, because, and you, you may be aware of this, uh, labor history is something that has been very badly neglected in the teaching of American history. Uh, you know, I went all through uh, the training of the historian, the orthodox training of the historian, uh, and got my Ph.D. at Columbia. And, you know, you would think that if somebody has a Ph.D. in history, he knows it all. That's what I thought. <laughs> but actually, I, I, I was aware as I was doing this, as I was studying history, I was aware that there were things missing in, in this uh, so-called advanced history, this doctoral program history that I was learning. And I think I was aware of it because I had, uh, well, before I went to graduate school, I, I'd, I'd been a, a shipyard worker for three years, and I'd, I'd been involved even as an 18-year-old in union activity, and uh, and uh, and I was interested in working people and and the, the labor movement, and I'd read things on my own, and and I. I uh, found that all these history courses I was taking and all the history texts that I was reading uh, seemed to ignore what to me seemed some of the most important events in American history. I mean, after all, the working people, they're the people, they're most of the people, and they were being left out of the histories. The people who were getting the most attention in the histories were the presidents and the congressmen and the members of the Supreme Court, and the, and the documents that we were reading were the laws passed by Congress and the decisions of the courts and the addresses of presidents. But they weren't giving us the uh, statements that appeared in little labor newspapers all over the country. They weren't telling us uh, what was happening among working people. They weren't working people all over the country. They weren't telling us about the struggles that working people were going through. I had to, I had to leave the classroom and go to the library in order to really learn something about the history of working people in the United States. This is still my advice very often to young people. Cut a class and go to the library, <laughs> really. <laughs> And there you, you know, there you will learn things that you will not get in class. There you will learn things that you don't get, you know, in your, your conventional textbooks. No, I remember, you know, um, my introduction to, to labor history, picking up in a library a book called uh, American Labor Struggles by Samuel Yellen. Uh, and uh, he was an English teacher. He wasn't a professional historian. Uh, you don't have to, I shouldn't say this. Um, be drummed out of the historical profession. You don't have to be a professional historian to do history, you know. And he w wasn't. But he, I was amazed at the things he had in his book that I didn't even know about, you know, because I had not learned anything in the my classes in uh, American history. Uh, I hadn't learned uh, about the great railroad strikes of 1877. It was an amazing phenomenon. Uh, in which railroads were in turmoil and strikes and all over the East Coast, violence, the National Guard called out, army called out, and a uh, hundred people dead, thousand people put in prison, missing from my history books. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, you know, they, they did say something about the panic of 1873. It's always a panic when the financial markets are troubled. So everything is, everything is judged by how 
the upper class is doing, my God, we're, we're in trouble. The stock market has gone down. But they don't talk about what people have gone down, uh, what has happened to ordinary people. So here I was, there's Samuel Yellen telling me in detail about the railroad strikes of 1877 and, and uh, about the Haymarket affair. Uh, and this was amazing to me. Here's one of the great and most dramatic and most important events in American history, and, and there's nothing about it uh, in my historical education. And uh, the one thing we did learn about, we learned about the uh, Pullman strike of 1894. That's because uh, Eugene Debs was involved, and Debs ran for president. If you run for president, you'll make the news, you see. But if you just organize a railroad boycott of the whole country and, 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 and drive the president crazy, uh, no, that's, that's not enough to make the news. So I learned about all these things. I learned about the, the Colorado coal strike of 1913-14, uh, the Ludlow Massacre. Actually, I had begun to, to look at that when I heard a song sung by Woody Guthrie called the Ludlow Massacre. Woody Guthrie led me to more labor history than all of my teachers at Columbia University had done. Uh, and so I went through the, these various chapters, and, and, uh, and it was a, a revelation to me. Uh, but that has been the story, uh, not just way back when I was a graduate student. That has been the story generally of uh, American education. It's begun to change a little in recent years because we have a, a, a new g generation of young historians who, like James Green, have seriously begun to project out into society the story of working people. And, we, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, people like David Montgomery. Uh, and, and we have a, sort of a number of, uh, of, uh, of scholars around the country who have been studying uh, uh, the history of working people. And so there's more consciousness of it, but it's still, it's still sort of uh, a minor theme in orthodox teaching of history. And, and it, the society is still geared to the problems of the rich. <laughs> Well, all you have to do is look at the papers. There's a business section. There's a business section. Now, is the ordinary working person interested in the business section? Um, well, uh, marginally. Uh, but there's no workers' section. There's no labor section. If there's a strike is taking place somewhere, and there are strikes going on all over the country all the time, which are not reported, it will get a small spot in the business section. So, uh, and of course, you know, you, you listen to the television and so on. What is on, what is on television every single night? The Dow Jones average. They give you the, they always give you the statistics on the Dow Jones average. They will not give you the statistics on how many people lost their jobs yesterday. How many people are collecting unemployment insurance? What is happening to the wages of working people? Uh, so we're still in a situation where the, the history and the situation of working people is not brought into the forefront uh, by uh, all of the institutions of American culture. And, and that's why it's, it is so important when somebody, when a historian uh, grabs hold of a, of a piece of, of uh, American history uh, which involves working people and, and brings it to the attention uh, of, of the nation. So when I, uh, when I r first read the manuscript of, of Jim Green's uh, death in the Haymarket, I, I was so uh, happy to see uh, what he was doing with this event. The, the interesting thing about the, the uh, ignoring of history and, and the ironic thing uh, about it is that these events in labor history are, are not dull events, not, not things you can put aside, oh, it's not very interesting. No, these are the, some of the most dramatic events in the history of the nation. Uh, and here at Haymarket, 
in 1886 is uh, the epitome of that. And, uh, and we've had labor historians who have written uh, labor histories, which are very, very good, but it's not too often that you get a labor history which is full of drama, which really captures the excitement of that historic moment. And that's, I think, one of the remarkable things about uh, a death in the Haymarket. Um, and so uh, Jim Green is just the right person to have undertaken the job of, of writing this story. He's been a labor historian for uh, many years, been teaching labor history at UMass Boston, has uh, been very active locally. He has uh, led these working tours uh, of, you know, you know about, everybody knows about the Freedom Trail, but how many people know about the Working People's Heritage Trail that takes people through the city and shows them all the places where uh, that are key moments of working class history, and Jim Green has done that. He is a, a, what we call a public historian. You know, they're historians who are not public. They're historians you never see or hear from. They're in the library, in the archives. They never come out. <laughs> he comes out, and uh, and he. Uh, and he not only does scrupulous historical research, but then he brings the results of his research to, to a larger public. He did that when he, he was working with Henry Hampton, who you may know as the uh, producer of Eyes on the Prize, and who, but who also did a series called The Great Depression on which, on which uh, uh, Jim Green worked. And so he has, he has this experience of, of uh, presenting history in a way uh, that carries, you know, the, the excitement that a television viewer has come to w want, you see. And, uh, and he's, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's written, uh, written several important books, and of which Death in the Haymarket is, is the latest. Uh, and I don't know what, what else to say about him, uh, except that, uh, uh, you should read his book. He will tell you about it. I should say one more thing about it. If any of you are subscribers to The Nation, or if you're not a subscriber and you can go to the library and get a copy of The Nation, a, a recent issue of The Nation, maybe the next to the last issue, has a marvelous review. Uh, so if you don't believe what Jim Green says about his own book, if you think he may be exaggerating the virtues of his book, as you know, writers tend to do. I've done this all the time, you see. Uh, if go to this review in the nation, it's a, and you will get uh, you'll get a really, really fascinating picture of what Jim has done in this book. So uh, here he is, uh, James Green, author of Death in the Haymarket. Good evening. It's, uh, thank you so much, Howard. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many friends, neighbors, family, colleagues, um, including many people who, who helped me write this book. Uh, you know, writers always say that it's a, a lonely, isolating, even alienating experience. Um, this wasn't the case for me, certainly not with this book. I mean, I can't uh, tell you how many people So, well, what are you writing about? Uh, tell me the story. And one of the great things I think a writer needs to do is to be able to tell the story verbally before you start writing. And so much enthusiasm, how is it going, you know, what did you write today? And so there are a lot of people who helped me a great deal, a lot of encouragement, a lot of enthusiasm. My wife Janet, my son Nick, my sister Beth are all here. Uh, thank you for your warm support. Also to some of my great readers, particularly my oldest and dearest friend and my best editor, Jim O'Brien. Sorry, don't, don't mean to embarrass you. Uh, and uh, Bob Dottilio read the, read the manuscript for me, Chris Daly, and of course Howard Zinn, who uh, actually persuaded me to write this book, sort of the story behind the story. I'd like to think it was my bright idea, but actually uh, he, was, he, he directed the uh, editor to me. 
And after he persuaded me to take on this story, which I wasn't sure that I wanted to do, he said, well, good. He said, you should, you should contact my agent. He does movies. <laughs> so this is my agent, Ike Williams, who has represented uh, me very well. Thank you, Ike. Um, I want to also thank uh, Michelle LeBlanc, Kristen Sherman, the Old South uh, Meeting House, um, the Lowell Institute, and Pantheon Books for supporting this event. Um, it's always great to be in the House of Dissent. You know, this is where, probably not from here, but there, Sam Adams sent the people of Boston over to the wharfs to dump the tea. William Lloyd Garrison spoke here, Norman Thomas, and you can see these wonderful uh, exhibits back here to the many dissenters who have used this space. This was the only place in Boston, am I right about this, Dottilio, that the people, the Sacco Vanzetti people could have a memorial? Well, he'll, he'll correct me later, something like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, they have it in their exhibit. Um, most of you have read something about the notorious Haymarket Affair that took place in Chicago in the midst of a mammoth general strike for the eight-hour day that began on May 1st, 1886. That was the first May Day. After three days of peaceful striking and picketing, lethal violence erupted on May 3rd, when the Chicago police shot and killed several unarmed picketers at the huge McCormick harvester plant. They called it the Reaper Works. The next morning, May 4th, the city's anarchists held a protest rally in Haymarket Square on the west side. There were a surprising number of revolutionary anarchists in Chicago at the time for reasons that have to do with that city's history and the experience of its immigrant workers. As the meeting wound down, it was about 10.30, it was starting to rain, only about 500 people were left in the square. A large squad of 176 Chicago police marched on the rally to disperse it. Just after the order was given to break it up, someone, and to this day we don't know who it was, threw a bomb into the ranks of the policemen. One patrolman died on the spot, Matthias Deegan, and six others followed him to the grave over the next weeks. At least three protesters died in the wild gunfire that followed, and many were wounded on both sides. This was the Haymarket tragedy. An avalanche of events followed this violent riot, creating what one historian called a drama without end. Sensational stories appeared in all the newspapers and magazines, helping to whip up a hysterical fear of an alien anarchist conspiracy. What one observer called, quote, a reign of police terror descended on Chicago as immigrants were arrested without warrant and civil liberties for workers were violated. The nation's first red scare ensued, stopping the eight-hour movement in its tracks and seriously tainting the cause of labor reform. That summer, the trial of the century took place in Chicago before a packed jury, and I mean a packed jury, packed with people who were sure to convict. It sentenced seven anarchists to death for aiding and abetting the unknown bomber and for trying to make anarchy the rule in America, as the prosecuting attorney put it. The trial of the Haymarket anarchists was perhaps the most overtly political trial in the nation's history. Finally, as the men were on death row, there was the suicide of one condemned anarchist, Louis Ling, and then the execution <clears throat> of the four other anarchists, excuse me, who had refused to beg for clemency. They were hanged on November 11, 1887, a day forever known to anarchists as Black Friday. The consequences of the Haymarket Affair were disastrous for the trade union movement, for radicals, for visionary reformers, and for immigrant workers in general. This evening, I'd just like to say a few words about why I wrote this book, why I decided to retell an old story for a new time, and I'd also like to make a few comments about how I wrote it, and then read you a few paragraphs for illustration. For years, I would wanted to tell a big, epic story with working people at the center of it, to do what Howard was 
is talking about. Indeed, I, I daydream sometimes about bringing labor history onto the main stage of popular nonfiction writing, try to write the breakthrough book for labor history. Of course, I was inspired in this by Howard's own path-breaking his, People's History of the United States, which, which does just that, and as a result sold more than a million copies. I should be so lucky. I wanted to take a similar approach to a critical episode in working people's history and dig deep into it, really deep. I'd been experimenting for a long time with various kinds of popular writing, with journalistic reporting, op-ed pieces, and writing narration for documentary film at Blackside. And all of this was aimed at um, telling what I called movement stories, that is, accounts of social protest movements, of which we have many examples in Howard's book. And it was also aimed at telling those stories in public, as I hope to do tonight. So this Haymarket book was a chance to combine these narrative approaches uh, with what I had learned as a scholar and a teacher of history at UMass. It was also uh, a really big chance to reach a wider public. Now, a few marks, uh, remarks about how I wrote the book. I wanted to retell the Haymarket story in, in different contexts than it had been told before, and there were three. <clears throat> First of all, I invited the readers to see the tragedy as a culmination of a long series of events that began in Chicago as soon as the Civil War ended. Indeed, death in the Haymarket begins on May Day, on May 1st, 1865. 1865. That was the day Abraham Lincoln's body came back to Chicago. And citizens of the city lined the rainy streets unified in grief. My project was to explain how that unity disintegrated in waves of hostility that engulfed the city over the next 19 years, including the 1877 railroad strike was a big, a big <clears throat> moment in that conflict, that ongoing conflict in which social tension seemed to be getting ratcheted up again and again, which is where the drama in the story comes from, I think. It was really there. I didn't have to invent it. This isn't a novel. This is history. So the first context for the story is Chicago, the history of Chicago. The subtitle of uh, my book is borrowed in part from Frank Norris's 1902 muckraking novel, which centered on the trading floor of Chicago's Board of Trade, where Norris told the epic of wheat, the epic of wheat. Norris entitled his book, The Pit, A Story of Chicago. Like Norris, I read the history of Chicago as more than a saga of a great metropolis. The city's colorful uh, history also epitomized the history of Gilded Age, industrial capitalism, and the working people who made it possible. My literary influences were not only Frank Norris and Carl Sandburg, who wrote rhapsodies to the city's vitality, the city of big shoulders, the nation's freight handler, hog butcher to the world, but also Theodore Dreiser, Upton Sinclair, Nelson Algren, Saul Bellow, and Studs Terkel, who evoked Chicago's dark side, the dark side working people saw. I hoped I could use the book to illuminate the hidden lives of immigrant working people who lived in the shadows. I wanted to put these people at the center of the story to rescue them from invisibility. This is a task that still needs tending to today when millions of immigrant workers who do the hardest work remain invisible to the rest of society. That's why the demonstrations last weekend were a good sign that maybe things are changing. So here are a few passages uh, from my story of Chicago. You know, I, I grew up in Chicagoland. Let's call it Chicagoland, within the shadow of the city, you know, reading Sandberg's poems and these stories, and I thought as I undertook this book, my God, I have a chance to tell my Chicago story. So. Here's a little bit of it. This is a, a sketch of Chicago after the Civil War. With easy access to eastern markets via the Great Lakes and to the western states via the Illinois and Michigan Canal to the Mississippi, Chicago businessmen enjoyed decisive advantages over all regional competitors. By the end of the Civil War, their city was the western terminus of every major railroad east of the Mississippi. All the Eastern railroads were built to Chicago, and all the Western railroads were built from it. 
the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy made the crucial link to Omaha and the vast Nebraska territory of corn and hog production, a connection that would extend all the way to the Pacific. The cornucopia of material goods that issued forth from Chicago's factories, forges, mills, and shops required an ever-expanding army of wage workers. As a result, the city acted like an enormous magnet that pulled in people from far and wide, farm boys, gamblers, Civil War veterans, tramping artisans, and Canadian adventurers. And from Europe came trainloads and boatloads of displaced peasants, farm laborers, as well as failed tradesmen, frustrated apprentices, political exiles, and unwilling conscripts. Chicago's population doubled during the 1860s, mainly because so many Europeans arrived. Now fast forward 13 years, this is the Chicago, <clears throat> the wonder of the world, of the industrial world in 1883. By the end of that year, Chicago's business was booming like ever, never before. Every day, 800 freight trains and passenger trains came and left the city's six busy terminals, hauling goods out and bringing people in. During the 1880s, nearly 250,000 European immigrants and Canadians flooded the city, looking for work in her roaring factories and mills. Overall, Chicago's industrial production advanced at a breakneck pace, multiplying 21 times in the decade. A spontaneously exploding center of force, it embodied, as few other places could, the brutal and inventive vitality of the 19th century. Nowhere was the creativity and brutality of rough-and-tumble business Chicago more obvious than in the slaughtering industry, where, as Saul Bellow wrote, progress was written in the blood of the yards. The city's largest meat packers, Swift and Armour, were true business revolutionaries whose innovations and industrial methods helped make Chicago a world city. <clears throat> The second context for the story is also indicated in the subtitle, and that is the emergence of the nation's first labor movement. I wanted to place the Haymarket story in the larger framework of how this labor movement emerged for the first time, with all of the passions and tensions, the hopes and dreams it aroused, and all of the sacrifices it demanded. One of my specific goals was to show why the eight-hour day was such a popular crusade in the 19th century, because I felt as though in our time people had really lost sight of why that was so important. And here are two passages aiming at bringing that movement alive. Beginning in the March of 1886, a strange enthusiasm took hold of wor working people in industrial centers across the nation as the dream of an eight-hour day suddenly seemed within their grasp. The agitation for shorter hours appeared everywhere by April, drawing thousands of unorganized workers into the swelling ranks of the Knights of Labor. Soon, a strike fever gripped the nation's workforce. It peaked on May 1st, 1886, uh, when 350,000 workers from coast to coast joined in a coordinated strike for the eight-hour day. These huge protests stunned observers abroad, like Friedrich Engels, who wrote from London, quote, history is on the move over there at last. The Americans, he remarked, were a people full of energy like no other, a people who astonished European socialists with the vastness of their movement. When the great upheaval reached its climax on May 1st, Chicago was its epicenter. At least 40,000 workers struck there, but after a while, it was impossible to keep count. Unlike the strikes in other cities where a few trades took the lead, the upheaval in Chicago reverberated through scores of shops and factories, construction sites, and packing houses. It emptied the huge lumber yards of workers, clogged the harbor with lake vessels, and stranded trains in the huge rail yards of the nation's transportation hub. The general strike even sucked in thousands of immigrant factory operatives and common laborers. Nowhere was the unskilled proletariat mobilized the way it was in Chicago. The urge 
to organize and mobilize even seeped into the worst sweatshops on the west side filled with the city's newest immigrants, Jews who had fled the horrendous pogroms in Russia a few years before. Abraham Bisno, a young cloakmaker, remembered that these newcomers spoke no English and no German and knew very little about the boycotts and strikes that were going on around them. Still, the eight-hour fever was so contagious it crossed into this isolated Jewish settlement. When an American member of the Knights of Labor struggled to explain the eight-hour day to these workers in English, there was chaos. There was a great tumult, as no recalled. Everybody was talking and nobody knew what this thing was about. But even a Yiddish speaker like Bisno grasped the core message. All I knew then was that the principle of the Knights of Labor was in the motto, one for all and all for one. Whether their pay was high or low, Chicago workers flocked to the eight-hour cause because it constituted a freedom movement. Eight-hour visionaries looked forward to a day when workers no longer lived just to work and simultaneously looked backward to a time when people toiled together under the sky and close to the earth, passing the time of day without clocks and factory whistles, without machines or foremen to govern their pace. The Knights of Labor opened and closed their meetings and rallies with songs that evoked a desire for freedom from the long arm of the job. Their anthem was the eight-hour song, and I, I won't sing it to you, but I'll, if I could. Here's, what, here's, how, here's how it went. We want to feel the sunshine. We want to smell the flowers. We're sure that God has willed it, and we mean to have eight hours. We're summoning our forces from the shipyards, shops, and mills, Eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will. Chicago's workers, who were mostly newcomers from other places, usually small towns and rural districts, missed the feeling of the sun on their faces and the smelling of flowers in the warm months, for they lived and worked in a city of smoke, where one traveler noted not even a ghost of the sun shined. Still, some found themselves tantalizingly close to nature at times. Those who toiled in the big reaper works on the Black Road, they actually call it that, and in the lumber yards could see the prairie grasses fading into the western horizon, and on some days they could even smell the crops when a dry prairie wind blew in from the northwest. On most days, however, a sickening odor drifted out of the stockyards and blanketed the immigrant neighborhoods of Pilsen, Bridgeport, and the west side. In a city where industry slaughtered millions of animals, blotted out the sky with smoke, poisoned the river with blood and guts, and ground up the fingers of factory hands like sausage stuffing, workers yearned to save part of themselves and to reclaim part of their day from the chaos of Chicago industry and from what Rudyard Kipling called its grotesque ferocity. <clears throat> Finally, and most disturbingly, there's the third context. Uh, the context uh, for writing about the bombing at Haymarket, the context of today, of an ongoing war on terror aimed at alien subversives, the same kinds of people who were suspects in the crime committed on May 4, 1886. So the third context is the bombing itself, the bombing that divided Gilded Age America, and left a conflicting set of memories, bitter, bitter memories in its wake. One of the greatest challenges in writing the book was to explain how some working people became so frustrated that they advocated acts of violence against their oppressors. I did not feel the need to condemn or condone the anarchists who saw dynamite as the great equalizer in the social struggle but I did need to explain them, and more generally to explain why an act of political violence occurred, not by accident, but at the end of a long train of abuses. I wanted to explain that this act of political violence, like so many others that followed, did not just come out of the blue. I also aim to show how the justice system of the time broke down completely when it came time to try and sentence the men who were accused of the bombing. I described that breakdown in some detail and tried to show how it resulted from a mood of hysteria after the event 
and from the broad public feeling that someone, someone in the immigrant community had to pay for it, even if there wasn't sufficient proof to offer of guilt. I was excited that I had a chance to write about the trial of the century. Wow, what a courtroom drama. This was not to be matched. But I also had to write about the agonizingly sad and deeply disturbing execution of four innocent men, three of them immigrants. I'll spare you the death scene, but I will read you a few paragraphs about the reaction to the hangings of the anarchist workers in Chicago on November 11, 1887, an execution that would be celebrated by elected officials and editors of the nation's newspapers and by large numbers of frightened citizens. Here are two passages about a few people who reacted to the executions not with joy, but with horror. Almost as soon as the men expired at the end of their ropes in the Cook County Jail, runners carried the word of the deaths to the Western Union Telegraph Office and newspaper row. The news was posted on billboards that put placed all over the city. At the luxurious Palmer House Hotel, the city's wealthiest citizens gathered after lunch to read the notice, Trap Fell, Spees, Parsons, Fisher, Engel, expiate their crime. The law is vindicated. One reporter described a palpable feeling of relief among downtown people because the execution had occurred without a single hand being raised in violent protest. Friends and relatives, advocates and supporters of the defendants had been preparing themselves for the deaths of the condemned men. But on the afternoon of November 11th, they still found themselves uncontrollably distraught over the news. Even those in faraway cities were deeply affected. From Boston, the editor of the prestigious Atlantic Monthly, the Dean of American Letters, William Dean Howells, wrote of his, quote, helpless feeling of grief and rage over the civic murder, these are his words, committed in Chicago, quote, this republic has just killed five men for their opinions. This he told his father in a letter. Howells believed that the executions dishonored the nation and the memory of Abraham Lincoln, whose campaign biography Howells had written in 1860. After years of optimistic contentment with the progress of what he called American civilization, and its belief in its ability to come out all right in the end, the writer now felt that the nation's story was coming out all wrong in the end. The death of the anarchists in Chicago shattered Howells' faith in the triumph of Lincoln's ideal republic, a republic with malice toward none and charity for all. In New York City, many Jewish working people in the tenement houses of the Lower East Side were palpably disturbed by the news that four innocent men, three of them immigrants, had died on the gallows in a land to which these foreigners had come seeking freedom and justice. <laughs> Quote, heartbroken, we walk for days like mourners, wrote the Jewish socialist Abraham Kahan. The distress of these immigrant workers deepened, he reported, when they realized how many Americans applauded the verdict and its execution. In Chicago, the defenders of the men were too devastated to speak in public or put their feelings on paper. For example, one of them was George Schilling, a labor reformer, activist, socialist, friend to all the men who died, even though he was not an anarchist. He was deeply shaken and embittered by the whole thing. Two years passed before he could gain some perspective on the event. And then he wrote this. Quote, this 11th November, 1887, has passed into history and marks the chief tragedy of the closing years of the 19th century. The trial of Parsons, Spees, et al. is over, and the verdict of the jury is executed, but the trial of judgment is still going on. And the trial of judgment is still going on in Chicago. Went on there for a long time, for many years, and I track some of that uh, in the book. Uh, and particularly, I want to end with one person who kept the story alive, 
uh, the great novelist of Chicago, Nelson Algren, author of Walk on the Wild Side and many important books. And this is what he wrote in 1951, more than 60 years after the hangings, in a book called Chicago, City on the Make. Long ago, the famous novelist wrote, Chicago had been the town of the great Lincoln liberals like John Peter Olkiel, the governor who pardoned three of the men who had life, given life sentences, the ones who stuck their stubborn necks out in the ceaseless battle between the rights of owners and the rights of man. Algren loved this Chicago that was once the most radical of all American cities, Gene Debs's town, Bill Haywood's town, the one big union town. But he also hated the place because it was most, the most brutal of all American cities, a town of hard and bitter strikes and trigger-happy cops, a town where undried blood on the, on the pavement still recalled the Haymarket tragedy. And, sh and so Chicago remained a city with many bone-deep grudges to settle. None greater, Algren thought, than, and here I quote him, the big, dark grudge cast by the four standing in white robes, hands cuffed behind at the gallow's edge for the hope of the eight-hour day. I hope people will read Death in the Haymarket and feel that they have read a book about justice and injustice. In this case, justice for immigrants and for revolutionaries dedicated to fighting oppression with force. Of course, as I was writing about the roundup of these so-called alien subversives after the event as I was writing about the violation of immigrant workers' civil liberties and human rights in 1886, as I was writing about the prosecution and ultimate execution of the Chicago anarchists, <clears throat> I couldn't help but think of the ongoing war in Iraq and what the administration calls its war on terror about the Patriot Act and the Attorney General's defense of torture, about the prisoners at Guantanamo, and about the federal prosecutors who conceal evidence and tamper with juries to convict suspected terrorists. And of course, as I was writing about Chicago's huge immigrant community and its struggles and travails, I couldn't help but think about the current debate over immigration restriction. I couldn't help but think about a debate which the New York Times recently observed has been, quote, hijacked by stereotypes of immigrants as potential terrorists living among us like pod people. But I chose not to make any of these direct connections between the past and present in my account. Death in the Haymarket is, after all, a work of history, a creation of a critical moment in the past. Still, if the Haymarket story I have to tell resonates with the concerns and fears of our time, then let the readers hear that resonance in their own ways. Thank you very much. a short period of question and answer, but we ask that you line up here at the microphone. So you can be heard on WGBH. Uh, your questions can be heard. Thank, Thank you. you so much for that warm response. I really appreciate it. So if you have a question, you actually do need to come up to this microphone. Otherwise, I'll be happy to go sign books. <laughs> Oh, comments. Uh, I mean, uh, nor normally on an event like this, we get declarations, right, Howard, and statements, and sure, sure. <laughs> I actually have a question. Oh. You mentioned the, that this, um, these events had a devastating effect mm -hmm. on the movement for an eight-hour day. Can you talk about the postscript a little bit? In sure, that sure, yeah. Um, you know, this is perhaps the most dramatic, but not the first or last event where violence breaks out for various reasons and has a devastating effect on movements for social reform, on radical movements. And the eight-hour movement was going very well. I mean, you know, they were winning, and they were winning peacefully. 
And when that bomb went off, you know, the opponents of eight hours had what they needed. The Knights of Labor, who were mostly Catholics, nonviolent, were now called the Dynamite Knights. So the whole labor movement got painted with this brush, and people became discouraged. You know, it's, it's a risky thing to go out on strike, and when you can be accused of giving aid and comfort to these people, uh, it was discouraging. Um, there were also people, the, the labor movement also lost its radical wing. It was extinguished. You know, these people, these anarchists were in the streets. They were the ones who were organizing, mobilizing, inspiring people. They were gone. You know, they were in prison. Some of them were executed. That's a pretty powerful lesson, capital punishment, you know, for political offenses. So all of that had a very devastating effect. The Knights of Labor uh, declined very quickly. This was the union of the big tent. You know, everybody was included. Uh, even college professors could join the Knights of Labor. Even housewives could join. The only people who couldn't join were lawyers, gamblers, liquor dealers, and real estate speculators. That's a big, that's a big tent. And, you know, uh, and purveyors of alcohol. There's some very knowledgeable people in this audience. So that's, that's one answer. Anyone else? I, uh, you, you said that the workers were so frustrated that they advocated violence against their oppressors. <clears throat> and I just wanted to point out that the violence against, against workers has, uh, was extreme. I mean, it, it's always been extreme. Their, the reaction in Haymarket Square was pretty minor in comparison. I mean, if you, you said the justice system was broken. Um, the justice system in this country was born broken. The Constitution, slavery is legal. The violence against people to engage in forced labor is extreme. What Jesse Jackson called economic violence, right? Well, uh, it was far more than economic violence that, that, that they were going through. And I, I, just, um, I just think it's important to emphasize the context in which all of this happened. Why were the workers in Chicago in the first place? Because they could no longer make a living out of the soil that is our common birthright in Europe and here. The enclosures then and now, all around the world. I think all these connections are important for what we I agree. move forward into today. I agree. Today. Thank you very much. Yes. Anyone else? I see there are a lot of students here, from uh, students from Boston Latin, and my friend Roger House. Where is Roger? Roger has students here from Emerson. I thank those teachers and those students for coming. Hi. You uh, mentioned that this was like the first Red Scare, and I wondered if you could elaborate on that. Was that um, just in Chicago that we saw that phenomenon, or was it across the United States? Yeah, it was pretty much a nationwide thing, and um, there were immediate calls for drastic uh, immigration restriction for, for the first time, the exclusion of immigrants who, had, who held certain political views. Uh, up until that point, you know, anyone could come. In fact, you know, there's, there's all this concern about illegal immigration now. In this period, no one cared. You know, everybody just came in and, and then became naturalized, became voters and all that. But then after Haymarket, all of these folks became suspect. And Theodore Roosevelt, who, who becomes president after the assassination of McKinley by someone who had thought to be an anarchist, really ends up getting through Congress a whole series of very, very drastic immigration restrictions, which, uh, for the first time, as I said, do apply to people's political views. Uh, in 1903, there's a law saying anarchists cannot enter the United States, and if you become an anarchist after you've been here for three years, which is mostly what happened, actually, they became anarchists after they came to Chicago, uh, then you could be deported. So that, that, that was part of the Red Scare. Yeah, well, I'm curious about uh, an aspect of what you've been talking about, which is the way people's perceptions were shaped. Um, you alluded to that a couple of times, yeah, yeah. how people felt, uh, what people thought about. You, you described a situation where there were people killed on May 3rd and then other people killed on May 4th. 
different perceptions, apparently. Yeah, um, yeah, right. And now the perceptions are extremely important. We have a much more sophisticated media system. Right. But uh, it has a, uh, an important uh, role in how people react to what's going on and decide what to do about it and how people can begin to mobilize or not mobilize. So when you looked at Haymarket, what were the how how would what was the role of media and, mm. and how did people form perceptions mm -hmm. back then so that yeah. you could conclude that people felt you know why did some people feel troubled mm -hmm. by the anarchists whereas other right. people presumably would have felt mm -hmm. uh, indignant about the 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 results of the the, the repression against the struggle for the eight right. hour day. Well, the, the media at the time was extreme. I mean, people really read newspapers. There were six daily newspapers in Chicago, and, and all of them were, were quite conservative. Um, and so <clears throat> there was a, a hostility to the immigrant radicals uh, from the very beginning. And I, a lot of people, Mother Jones was in sh Chicago at the time. It seemed like everybody was there during the And Mother Jones was there at working as a widowed dressmaker. She wasn't an anarchist, but she perceived the hysteria that was whipped up and created the Red Scare as being generated largely by the newspapers, particularly by the Chicago Tribune. Now, the fact of the matter is the anarchists had their own paper. There was a very vibrant labor press, most of it not published in English. The Arbeiter Zeitung had 20,000 readers. It was a daily. And they were the ones who said, let's get it, you know, we're angry about the workers who were killed at McCormick's. But you can imagine what happened when seven policemen died. I mean, this was, nothing like this had happened in peacetime America. And uh, it was, uh, created a great fear. Uh, as much as people in some ways looked down on the police as a set of working class guys who could be easily bribed and so on, they were Irish Catholics, etc. They still saw this as the thin blue line between them and the ragged edge of anarchy. And when these police were killed by the hands, by one hand, throwing one bomb, it threw a tremendous scare into people. And the newspapers did everything they could to, to so yes, the media was extremely important. And important, as the previous speaker was indicated, in what it didn't report about all of the working class people who were killed uh, before this. Yes. <clears throat> Hi. Um, in considering the civil rights movement a success, there were always two wings to it. Those being yeah. the followers of Martin Luther King, which is the more popular one, at least now in the history books, of the nonviolent peace protests and whatnot. But there was always the other side of the Malcolm X, who was the more militant one. But even less known is the movement in the South, led by people like Robert F. Williams, who regularly shot back against the Ku Klux Klan and sometimes even against police when they were working in tandem with it. Why is it that you believe that they decided to play up this, this killing of seven policemen much more than they did maybe in the times of the Civil Rights Movement, seeing as how they seem to have more reason to appease the workers than they would angry poor blacks? Mm -hmm. Well, part of it has to do with the point I just made about the media and this, this trauma about the... Uh, the police. Uh, you know, I calculated that in the 1877 railroad strike, I think maybe a hundred civilians had died. There were many other deaths. And as far as I can tell, no militiamen, no Pinkertons, these were the private guards, like uh, no Klansmen, <laughs> no uh, police officers had suffered any fatality. So uh, the, the losses were all on the side of the people. And yet, in terms of popular indignation, popular concern, it was all about the police. Now, your, your other point about armed self-defense, Robert Williams and, and the Black Panthers and people like that, that was exactly what was going on in Chicago. People, these were Germans, <laughs> Bohemians, very poor people, actually living in the part of Chicago that's now the African-American part of Chicago, and feeling like um, their lives were in danger. Uh, from the police or from vigilantes, and so they said, well, we're going to have our own militia to protect ourselves. So it's very much like what you were talking about in, in the South and in the northern cities. Thanks. I think we have time for a couple more questions, and then we, uh, we're going to adjourn. All right, Jim, I, I saw you straining when you, to talk about what's going on today. <laughs> I, li I like to make the leap. 
Um, Please. The fight for the eight-hour eight day, the fight against child labor. Um, at one time, um, up to a third of the, uh, the, wor the working people were unionized. Now it's about 10 to 12 percent or so. How do you see the state of working people today? Mm -hmm. um, where are we going? Yeah. Um, are, you know, are, are things better than they were? Are things worse than they were? Um, wow, Roger, th thanks for that. <laughs> you should come up here and help me with that. <laughs> um, well, you know, organized labor is in a bad way now. And I mean, the eight-hour day, I think most people are losing it. You know, they're losing it. I mean, overtime. And the nurses were fighting here against force overtime. So things are going, you know, history, history goes backwards sometimes. And uh, there aren't, of course, of course, compared to where unions were or working people were in the Gilded Age, I mean, there were no labor laws, zero. They passed a, an eight-hour day, a law in Chicago in the 1860s, and the employers simply ignored it. So maybe, maybe that's a lot of what's happening now, too. But, but because of similar forces at work, the labor movement uh, has deeply weakened. But I, there are some people in this auditorium, or is this not a church anymore, I guess, but this wonderful meeting hall, uh, who are working on that right now as we speak, trying to create a new labor movement, maybe one that doesn't depend on the law. Maybe the, maybe the anarchists knew something, actually, about <laughs> depending on the law for your strength. And, you know, uh, I get asked about this a lot because in my other things I do, I'm a labor educator and I comment on contemporary affairs and the reporters always say, oh, the numbers, the numbers are down. And I say, yeah, they're, they're, it's a leaner movement, but it's a lot meaner and it's a lot smarter. So I think sometimes people do learn uh, from history. And um, I'm expecting the labor movement to come back because, because I think working people need it. This may be, if I could make this the last question. Years well, the this last. goes back to the book. It may be nitpicking, but... The word anarchist to me means total disorder and possibly violence. Right. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the person who threw the bomb was one of those who felt justified in a violent mm -hmm. act which hurt people. And by the way, did they ever pursue in any way the trail of whoever might have thrown it? Yeah, it's a great mystery, a great mystery. Um, people in Chicago are still talking about this. I, <laughs> I go to bars and they say, well, what if, you know, what if it was an off-duty policeman? who was really throwing the bomb at the anarchists, but it came up short and landed, you know, landed amongst the police. I mean, there's this great mystery about it. Um, there were anarchists in the movement who were prepared to use violent means, armed self-defense, and in a, in a battle they expected to begin, that when they were attacked by the militia, the police, they expected to fight back, and they thought this would be the beginning of the revolution. They did think that. In terms of what they thought about what, what was anarchy, I mean, one of the things I tried to do in this book is actually explain what they meant by that. Because, of course, most people would say what you, you say is it's chaos, it's total violence, it's everyone attacking everyone else. And actually, if you read their stories and what they believed, they were actually, in a way, pacifists. So they, thought, they thought the violence in society was coming from the top down, was being perpetrated by the state, which after all was the agency that declared wars and the police. Uh, and so they really wanted a peaceful society, but paradoxically, they thought they might have to fight to get it. So uh, on that rather sober note, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end and um, set up shop over here. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.